Hey guys, welcome to the shop. This week we should have two videos. This will be a two-parter. In this video, we work on the Duval saw again. The shaft that goes through the center of the variable speed drive pulley is that same piece of Aquamet 22 that we broke the carbide drill off in last week. So we finish the deep hole drilling on it, we get it in the milling machine, machine the flats, and then we drill the oil holes you know, for the bushings. Man, and if I don't ever work in that stuff again, I'll be fine with that. Yeah, I'm sure it's great stuff, but man, that stuff's tough to drill. Anyway, we finish it up, then we get to the hub, which is in the lathe now, and then the lathe breaks, and we got to fix it. So you'll see, that's in part two. So watch at the end for a box that uh, the lathe repair video will be in. Anyway, thanks for watching, guys. Let's get started. So my strategy on this deep hole is pretty simple. Go really slow and not let any chips really build up in the hole. Cut for a few seconds, five seconds, stop, back out, and go back in. Now, I don't have to use my you know, tailstock for this. I actually could use a drill chuck on the carriage, but for a lathe this big, moving the carriage is about as much effort as it is to screw out the tailstock. You know, I'm not saving really any energy. Maybe a little time, but that's it. So that's kind of the idea. Lots of oil, and, you know, go slow. Once it starts cutting, I just put the pressure on it and keep it cutting. I don't want it rubbing. I don't like those sounds either. There we go. Cutting. Stop and clean it out. I don't get much out of there every time. But stuff's coming out. That's really all that matters to me. This stuff seems to dull this bit pretty quick. It could be because I'm sharpening it by hand and the geometry is not excellent on it. But whatever, it's got to be done. Just stoning this as best as I can, trying to you know, keep a good edge on it makes a difference. You can tell it when you start drilling. I'm not drilling a whole lot each time. That way, even if this thing does break off in there, you know, it's not jam-packed with chips that would make its, you know, the extraction of the broken drill even harder than it already is. And even if it's cutting good, I stop because I don't want to get greedy and jam this thing up. So I flipped the shaft around, I center drilled it, going in straight with a 3164th drill, no pilot drill. I think, in my opinion, I'd rather break off a larger bit in a hole than a smaller one. At least I can get in and around the flutes and have something to grab onto with a substantial tool. That's kind of the idea. So, start on this side.
We have heard the say, quit while you're ahead. That's, that's kind of where I'm at. You know, I, even though I want to drill all the way through this material for just personal reasons, really, um, you know, I've decided to stop. Uh, about three inches from being, from my drills meeting up in the center, I've got it marked out here. You see, still got a little portion in the center, but every chip that I take from this point at this point in this material is making me cringe and I'm afraid that you know I'm gonna just break off a drill simply because I just want to drill through this. There is no issue with oil in this thing on both sides. So that's what I'm gonna do. <laughs> I want to quit while I still got holes without broken drills in them. And if I could describe this material in you know in one word it would be extreme it would be tough. Because extremely tough would be two words. Anyway, this stuff reminds me, the chips remind me of like a huge flake of heavy chrome off an old school truck bumper or something. It, you know, describing the, the way that the chips feel. This stuff is just ridiculous. Anyway, let's go over the milling machine. Let's see if we can't get our oil holes drilled in this and our flats machine on it. Well, it's time to transfer the features over from the old shaft to the new one. We got two flats and three oil holes. Where I'm not drilled all the way through, my shaft is you know, not hollow, I'm um, not going to have this central oil hole. We have two here that we're going to transfer over, but I'm going to change from the original design a little bit. The bushings in the hub, this is the old hub, but the new one's exactly the same, are two and a half inches long, and they're on each side. If I stay with the original design, these oil holes are almost all the way towards the end, you know, right at the beginning of the bushing, leaving, you know, the back part you know, with no nothing other than oil creep to get oil to them. So what I'm going to do is move these holes in just a little from the original design and then take a ball nose end mill and just put a small cavity along the top of the shaft so the oil can disperse a little more along the bushing. That's kind of the idea anyway. And then other than tapping the ends of this shaft, I think uh, it'll be pretty much done. So that's kind of the idea. I think, you know, without a central oil hole, this may help a little bit. It will, probably won't make any difference. It would work fine the way it is, but that's what I'm going to do. So a little shop power update. Got my phase converter running outside the 20 horsepower unit that was sent to me by American Rotary. I finally got everything wired up, you know, to that one unit, which is nice. So just flipping that switch turns everything that I have that has you know a three-phase motor on or it allows it to be turned on because for those outside of the US that have three-phase power it's just not common here not in a residential area and you've got a couple choices you could pay the power company thousands of dollars usually uh, sometimes tens of thousands of dollars to run three-phase to your shop or you can change all your motors and your industrial equipment to single phase that gets pretty pricey pretty quick if you have more than one unit or you can buy a rotary phase converter and you know run three phase which is what most people do here and that's what i'm doing maybe you can hear that phase converter maybe you can't but just an update it's been trouble free and it's nice to have everything on one switch it just makes it so much easier so Dennis Nolan is a big friend of the YouTube machinist community. Me and Elizabeth met him at the Bar Z Summer Bash this year. He works at Niagara Tools and offered to send me a big box of cutters, which he did. This is just some of them. Some that I'd never even, you know, I've never seen an edge like that before. Never used it, so I can't wait to try that out. But anyway, he's got a YouTube channel called The Cutting Tool Designer, if that tells you anything. The guy knows his stuff when it comes to cutting tools, that's for sure. So send me a whole bunch of nice ones that we'll be using here in the shop, you know, off and on. I've used Niagara cutters forever, but, you know, we're going to be using these quite often, I assume, because I've got a bunch of them now. So this is the one we're going to use for the job we got in the mill right now. So let's go over there, use that. Go check his channel out. He's a super nice guy, and I really appreciate the cutters. They'll definitely help out around here. So let's see how this cutter performs in this material. This is a 40 thousandth depth of cut. We're going to cut an inch and a half long, and we'll do the same thing on the other side of the shaft.
it's nice. So that end mill gave us a really nice finish and a good lead out. It's not just a sharp 90 degree um, transition there. So now I'm just going to reposition these clamps and then we'll drill some holes in the stuff. Just do one clamp at a time. That way I keep my holes going down straight on, on the top here. Alright, so we've got two center holes, or oil holes, that we need to drill here. We're going to spot drill them first with just a carbide spotter. I'm going to use collets for everything. Then I'm going to use this little set that Drill Hog sent me. And we're going to drill our oil hole 3 sixteenths of an inch. And we're going to just hold everything in collets, just so I don't have to move this table up and down so much. We're going to use the little set here that Drill Hog sent us. These are Cobalt M42. We're going to use 3 sixteenths because that is the size that the original holes in the original shaft was. These drills have three flats on them on the shank, but they also have a portion that's to diameter, so we can also hold it in a collet, which is what I'm going to do. And we'll see how they perform on this material. Just gonna peck at it. I think I'm gonna slow that down just a little. It's probably not too fast, but better safe than sorry on this stuff. Probably more like it. That even may even be fast. No, there's lots of cutting pressure is what it needs. Man, that stuff's nasty. Drill for a second and stop. I can see this thing breaking. stuff to drill. I did one. Alright, so we made it through one hole. And this bit did suffer some. I mean, in fact, I'm going to touch up that edge before I even attempt to drill this other hole. I'm just going to hit it with a stone. I'll show you, I'll show you a close-up of it. 
This stuff's horrible, man. There you go. That's what it looks like after one hole through about maybe a little over a quarter inch of material in that uh, Aquamet 22. should work. Just wanted to knock off those rough spots. All right, so let's see if this works now. I slowed it down even more. I, I think we is maybe going just a hair fast for this type of stuff. So this is a little solid carbide and agri ball end mill. We're going 20,000 steps to cut. We're going to cut an inch long slot on the top of this shaft here. That went surprisingly well. So I just showed both these products removing layout fluid. Both do a really, really good job. And I was looking at the, the ingredients, the chemical makeup. I'm no chemist, but both are very similar. And it says, cannot be made non-poisonous. Contains acetone, tadalene, carbon dioxide, and methanol for the CRC. And for the Supertech, it says, cannot be made non-poisonous. May cause blindness if swallowed. Wow, that's not very good. Uh, contains acetone, methanol, tadalene. This one has heptane and exilene, which I'm not familiar with. X Y L E N E. Like I said, I'm not a chemist, but you know both work extremely well depending on you know your availability or the price. You, know, you can use either one for you know, layout fluid remover or probably carburetor cleaner if you tried. But there you go. They use a ton of that stuff. All right, so for our M42 Cobalt Drill Hog Drill. I think it performed about as good as anything would in this stuff. It probably would not have experienced the edge damage that it did if I wasn't running it probably on the fast side. You know, I wasn't running fast for a 316th drill. 
but I probably was running fast for it in this material. Probably just my fault, which is most drill failures in my opinion, is operator error or running too fast or not enough coolant, whatever. You get the idea. I did touch it up and I got two holes out of it and I would use it right now for anything. It's still plenty good. So there you go. It performed as good as anything of good quality would, I think, in this situation. Well, that turned out really nice. We got, you know, a little wider distribution area there than what uh, just that one hole would provide. Maybe it'll help, maybe it won't, but I thought it wasn't a bad idea. You know, all I'm doing now is removing all the burrs from around these areas, which are not much, but I don't want a sharp edge there. So just using a tapered stone to kind of round all these edges. So I've got my hub dialed in and I should be ready to bore these bushings out to inch and a half. I left them small when I made the bushings because I wanted to bore this as a unit just to assure that I got the most concentric OD and ID of the bushing as I could get. So I also got to put in snap grooves for our pulley halves. I do not have a Morse taper number three bull nose center. This really needs some support for a grooving tool. But I think I'm going to use my steady rest. And uh, that should be good enough as long as I have clearance to get in there. So, it should be fine. So let's get in here, bore these out, cut our snap ring groove, flip it. You know, Bob's your uncle. good finish in there. Let's uh, see what we got. So check out this set of internal mics. I'm using these to gauge this bore. These are made by Brown and Sharp. There is no part number on them, but they have a patent date of January 29th, 1907. So that's 112 years old. And still, still a good set. This is from 1 inch to 2 inch is their range. And, um, we started off at 1.4 inch on this bore, left them 100 thousandths small. I took two cuts of 10 thousandths each. There we go. And we are, yeah, 21 thousandths, 1.4, and 21 thousandths. So check out that. That's a old but good set. Alright, so that should be it. Got a great finish in there. Let's see how it fits. This is just a piece of drop. That's what I want. Well, maybe that is on the tight side. May do a spring pass and that'll be good enough. This thing has to have, I would rather this be on the loose side than on the tight side. 
plus it's got to line up with the other bushing so I'm gonna take a couple thou out of that probably once it gets all oil film and stuff you know it'll be good I just don't want it to be too tight because I'll run into trouble better loose than tight so I'll do a spring pass and then we'll flip it and do the other side Like so many old lathes, mine did not come with a steady rest, and I had to build one. I don't think I've ever showed this, but it's one of the first projects that I've done for this machine. And uh, like so many other projects, it never got quite finished. It did get to a point to where I could use it, and that's where it's stayed. It never even got paint. It did get primer. But simple design, made a three-quarter inch plate. It's a little lighter duty than what this lathe would have come, from, come with factory, but for the work that I do it. You know, it's more than adequate. Brass rollers, nothing special, no bearings or anything. The pins that go through these rollers are drilled lengthwise about three quarters of the way through and then cross drilled so you can take your ball oiler or your oiler and put a little oil on the on the shaft that these brass rollers rotate on. I never, like I said, quite finished it and tied in. I kind of got uh, to a project where I needed it, started using it, and found that it worked fine the way it was, and just stopped. But these really needed tied into the to the actual uh, rollers themselves. But it works fine. And if you're not familiar with what one of these does, it's just for part stability. Like if you're running a long part like this one, that's hanging out of the chuck quite a bit. I don't want to come in here without any support and try to cut a groove in here like I'm going to do for a snap ring. And all this does is going to keep this part stable. So let's cut our snap ring in here. Then this side will be done. I'll flip it, do the exact same operation on the other side. We'll press in our rubber lip seals, and then this part will be done. Well guys, unfortunately I'm going to have to stop this video here. It'll be way too long otherwise, take me forever to upload. First time I've ever had an issue with this lathe, so you know I can't say that I'm you know, surprised or disappointed really. That's just the way it goes with mechanical stuff. So click, click on this video up here when this little box pops up and that'll take you to the repair video. And uh, you'll see what we do to try to get it back going. So thanks for watching guys, I really appreciate it. Click on my little guy to subscribe to the channel. You know, make sure to hit the bell. Thanks to my viewers, patrons, and subscribers. That's it. So thanks for watching, guys. I'll see you next time.